Hello, Internet people. Today, I would like to show you the third version of my time-based upgrade for the PM6665 or PM6669 frequency counter. Uh, as you may know, I designed an OCXO board to replace the crystal oscillator, which normally comes with these units. And I made several improvements on the latest version of the design. So I would like to explain you exactly why I made these improvements and to show you the positive results they bring to the project, especially since that I now believe that the project is complete. So stay with me. I would like to spend a few minutes to show you the different parts of the design and explain you some of the design choices I made for the latest revision of that project. So first of all, we can start with the power supply. I, as I described before, uh, the, the heart of the, the power supply is a DC to DC converter. The reason for that is to make good use of the power available from the transformer of the unit. I did add a fuse at the beginning of the circuit. And the reason for that is because sometimes the MLCC capacitors uh, on, these, um, power, on these power supplies tend to short. And if that happens, I don't want to blow up the transformer of the instrument. Similarly, there is um, a TV, uh, TVS uh, diode here to prevent any um, burst of high voltage or any power surge from damaging the unit. Uh, if, if the power of the, the power surge is very high, it's just going to blow the fuse and protect the rest of the circuit. The goal was not to protect the instrument, uh, it's just to add protection for that circuit, even if that circuit is much less valuable than the instrument itself. But uh, the responsibility of an OCXO board is not to protect the power of the instrument. So that's why I did it that way. There are some um, power decoupling capacitors. Uh, the reason why is because there are some on the DC-DC converter itself, but I don't really know their values. And also, it's always beneficial to have different values and different sizes of decoupling capacitors because each size and value performs better at different frequency. I also have a power LED, very simple, a power selection switch, which I described before, which allows me to select either power from the instrument or power from the DC-DC converter. Frankly, uh, I don't intend to use uh, power from the instrument for the reason I described before. There's not enough power available from the LDOs of the instrument, but that, that would be good for future reuse or if I want to reuse that board for another project. There is a voltage reference, a four volt voltage reference. Uh, that's very important because the OCXO has, um, it's actually a VC OCXO in the sense that it's voltage controlled for the adjustment. And you don't want to have instabilities on the adjustment voltage. So I have a four volt reference. It's a REF 5040. It's a very well known reference. It's, it's pretty good in its specification and very low cost, very easy to obtain. And that gives me a four volt reference uh, that I then feed into the OCXO through a trim pot, which is there. And that simply takes the power from the, uh, the, the, the reference output of the reference. Uh, divide it and, and feeds it into the, um, the OC. So I do have a small capacitor uh, to help uh, with stabilization. And uh, yeah, that's it for the reference. The OC so itself, it, it's very simple because it just takes the power from the switching relator, the reference, which is adjusted with, with the trim pot, and then the output is fed straight to the instrument. Uh, there is some connections. Not all the pins are used, but I did define them all just in case and for clar clarity. And also if I ever want to add some new features to the project, but they are not all used for, for that extension board. And you may notice something here, output buffer. And this is something new in that third version of the project. Uh, what I realized is that calibration was not very easy with the first version because I didn't have an output. So I added a small SMA output on the design, which allows me to simply connect the output of the, um, the OCXO to an oscilloscope and to do the calibration much more easily than before. And also, because this instrument will have an OCXO, I may want to use the output of the OCXO to, uh, to act as a reference for another instrument, but I don't want to load the output of the OCXO itself too much for multiple reasons. First of all, it's not designed for that. And also because there is a relationship between the output frequency of the OCXO and the amount of loadings that is on the output. It's a very low relationship. I don't expect it will be a problem, but just for the sake of uh, uh, not disturbing the calibration, depending on what I connect to the output, it's good to have some buffer. The buffer I use is a SN75, 
176. It's normally meant uh, to be a differential driver for RS485 or similar differential line uh, transmission protocols. Um, the reason why I've chosen that circuit, frankly, is because it was readily available, it was pretty cheap, it was available uh, on the assembly house I used to build a PCB. And finally, uh, I didn't have a lot of time to research any other alternative. Um, if I remember properly, it has a 10 megahertz bandwidth, so it means that I'm kind of pushing it to, the, to its limits, so the output signal is not going to be a very nice square wave, but that's fine for, for what we are using here. And also, if I really need a very nice sine wave, I always have a jumper resistor here, which is the do not populate uh, on the design, but I can always remove the buffer, populate a zero ohm jumper here, and that will bridge the output of the O6 so straight to the SMA connector. So that's always an option if, if I want, for instance, to use the board for another project. So yeah, that's that's it for the for the internals of the design. Uh, so now let's take a look at the PCB itself. For this last version of the design, I wanted to experiment a bit and use an assembly service for the SMT components on the, the board. And I never done that before. Either. So I've been using the promotion at GLC PCB uh, to get them to assemble the boards and not just do, do the PCB. Um, it's not a sponsored video. Um, I don't have any interest in GLC PCB. I just wanted to explain what I did. So the boards have been delivered like that. Uh, I got 10 of them originally. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, the, the, pa the packaging is pretty well, pretty well done. Uh, it comes with tape like that. So of course one is missing because I've been testing it. Uh, so let's take a, a look a bit closer to it. Put that away. Okay. So this is the last version of the design. Uh, here's the input production circuit that I described. Here are the pads to mount the DC-DC converter. Here is the five volt, uh, the, sorry, the four volt reference for the OCXO. And here is the output buffer uh, that allows to drive the SMA connector, which is right there. On the other side, um, hello Kitty. On the other side, let me remove the cat because there's some AC powered stuff nearby and I don't want to eat fried cat tonight. So this is the mounting point for the SMA connector. This is the place for the OCXO. Here is the mounting location of the trim pot. And here is the mounting location of the uh, DC-DC converter. One interesting note here, the reason why I mounted the trim pot very close to the OCXO is an attempt to reduce the variation of the temperature of the trim pot itself because these components tend to have a relatively high temperature coefficient, I believe in the order of 200, 200 uh, ppm per degree Celsius. So uh, yeah, by putting it next to the OCXO, what I'm hoping is that uh, the temperature variation of the trim pot itself we, will be stabilized by the the regulation, the temperature regulation of the OCXO. And here on the top, I have the power input terminals. And you may notice I also added some holes, which are not, not used in the, the PM6665 or PM6669. It's, sim it's simply if I want to use the design in another project. Uh, obviously, uh, it's pretty convenient to have all the uh, SMDICs, all the diodes, all the capacitors and resistors already soldered. It, it makes me... Uh, gain some time, but obviously the benefit of using an assembly service gets lower uh, when, when you get a low number of boards because it does take some preparation time to, to prepare the files for the assembly house. And I really wish GLC PCB would simply be able to take the Eagle files because I'm using Eagle, but that could be any other software that you want and, and just run it in, into their processes. Because uh, for instance, in the Eagle reference, um, the orientation of the pin number one of the ICs and the diodes were all reversed uh, when compared to the GLC PCB reference. So it took me a lot of manual fixing of the files and, and yeah, it's a waste of time. So they could automate that and I really wish they do it. So yeah, with that being said, uh, here is the latest version of the design. And now let's take a look at it in action in an actual instrument and let's do the calibration together. So here is the latest version of my OCXO time base mounted inside one of the frequency counter. Uh, the blue wire is simply the power supply, which I got from the main power switch. 
and uh, you can see the SMA connection right there for calibration, the OCXO right there. I mounted a small pin here to act as a ground which helps if I ever want to connect an oscilloscope uh, or something like that. And yeah, that's basically, uh, that's basically it. Here you can see the um, calibration potentiometer. I use the right angle one which is very convenient because I can access it from the top to do the calibration and the SMA uh, output here can be connected to an oscilloscope or frequency counter. So let's do the calibration now. So here is my calibration setup. Uh, this is my other PM6665 counter. This one uses the first version of the, the design. It's working well. And I'm going to use it to pre-calibrate, uh, to do the gross calibration of the, the new board. And once the calibration is done, uh, the RAS calibration is done, I'm going to use the oscilloscope to do a very fine calibration by looking at the phase variation between the output of the new board and uh, GPS DO. If you don't have a GPS DO, you can use any other um, 10 MHz source that you may have and which is uh, the best that you have and what it will give you is a calibration of your board against the best calibration source that you have. Obviously a GPS DO is the best or one of the best things you can use but uh, you can always do it differently if needed. So yeah, let's proceed. So the first thing I want to do is do a course calibration. Uh, currently the reading frequency of the display here is 10 seconds, which is going to be a bit slow and inconvenient. So I'm simply going to change the measurement time to get a reading every second. Um, I have less resolution, but for the initial calibration it's going to be good. Just a word of caution, uh, this instrument has uh, AC live here. Uh, so just be careful and yeah, this video is for professionals. Uh, I assume you have the knowledge to assess the risk properly. So with that being said, let's change the frequency uh, to reduce it as close as possible to 10 MHz. So when I, turn, when, when I turn the pot clockwise, it goes in the wrong direction. So what I want to do is turn it counterclockwise to get a frequency close to 10 MHz pretty fast and easy like this. Now I can move to a 10 second measurement time and uh, yeah, obviously it's going to be a bit longer, but it will allow me to get a closer reading and a more precise reading. And then I can move to the oscilloscope uh, method. Okay, that should be close enough. So let's move to the oscilloscope now. So let me switch the view here. Grab the signal here, I can turn it off, put it in there. And yes, we are pretty close to the 10 MHz reference frequency here. Uh, just a quick note, you see that the signal shape is almost a square wave that's expected because that's the output we should be getting from the buffer I put on the circuit. Um, yeah, just, just a quick note, so that's expected. So let's put the screwdriver in the adjustment slot again and let's stop the relative movement of the traces between each other. And it seems like this is pretty close. Yep. And now it's calibrated. Just like that. Fast and easy. Just a quick note. Um, when I did turn on the board here with the OCXO for the first time, it took several hours and in fact several days for the reading to stabilize. Um, initially, if you remember, on the counter here, the last two digits were um, 48 or 49. When it initially started, it read 51. And after a few hours, it moved to 50. And then after a few more hours, it, it moved to 49 all the time. And then after actually a day or two, it moved to somewhere between 48 and 49. So it really shows that these OCXOs really benefit from being on all the time. You really don't want to turn them on just when you need them because it's going to take a while for them to stabilize. And that's also why uh, I started a video with the circuit and the system operating because I wanted to benefit from having the OCXO wound up so that I could do a calibration which is going to be close to the steady state of the system. Yeah, definitely not moving. And also a, a quick check to see if it's actually very stable is to take my 10 megahertz reference, which I used to calibrate the OCXO in that counter a few actually weeks or even actually maybe one month or so ago. And I can do a reading again.
move to a 10 second measure in time. And let's wait a bit more because the first reading is expected to be a bit off because I connected it and there could be some uh, some problem because of that. And yeah, dead on, 10 megahertz, dead on, nothing more, nothing less. So the OCXO inside here is edging pretty well. Uh, it's possible there is a slight difference, but it's below the reading precision or the, yeah, the, the, preci the resolution of the, the display here. So it's a non-issue. So I consider this project a success because clearly uh, the frequency stays stable. Obviously, I will have to see what happens after a few maybe years, but for now it works really well. Uh, it was a nice adventure. I got to experiment with the assembly service of GLCPCB. Um, it was also nice to design a retrofit board for an existing instrument. This instrument is actually very old. Um, the date codes on the ICs show 40, uh, 86 or 87 year uh, of manufacture. So basically this, instru this instrument is approximately 35 years old. And it's pretty interesting to see that we can take old instruments like that and still make them much better today at a very low cost. So that's it. I hope that you enjoyed this little project. Uh, I definitely did enjoy sharing it with you. If you have any question, as always, you are free to post a comment down below and uh, feel free to subscribe if you like the content and want more of it. And yeah, it was nice presenting that project to you. Uh, talk to you next time. Bye.